Hi, good afternoon. My name is Jay Rothman and welcome to Real People, Real Health. I am excited. It is Monday afternoon coming in from the U.S. at 2 p.m. I'm excited to introduce Janine Janicelli coming in from Boca Raton, Florida. Welcome to the studio, Janine. Thank you, Jay. Thanks so much for having me. I am excited to, uh, to have you in the studio. We met uh, about a month or so ago through a couple of uh, other women that uh, have been in the studio and, and come live uh, with me to share their story of, uh, of how they had to face their own medical diagnosis and prognosis. And um, I, through the, I believe through Carrie, I, I was introduced to you and uh, Carrie Crary actually was uh, participated in a, in a reality TV show filming that you also were in. And we'll get to that later uh, later on during our conversation. But as we wait for some to join us in a in the studio as part of our Facebook community live streaming, I'd like to uh, thank them for joining us today. If you hear anything that you like or love, uh, feel free to, uh, to, with love, touch the love button or like. And if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to, uh, to ask Janine and or myself, and we'll do our best to, to share that with you. Um, in the meantime, what I'd like to do, uh, Janine, is, is invite you to kind of give a little bit of backstory, because when I asked you to, to kind of share some highlights with me yesterday, I was absolutely struck by how many years and how many different diagnoses you have gone through, if, my, uh, if I recall correctly. It was 2001 when you were first, uh, first diagnosed with, uh, you had some basal cell eventually leading to melanoma. I believe you had said you had gone through something like 22 skin surgeries. Yeah. And from, from 2001 moving forward, you had multiple different diagnoses of cancer. I would, I'd like to invite you to, um, to begin to share with us kind of from a chronological perspective, um, what those diagnoses were and, and how you navigated through each one. And, uh, and then uh, we'll go from there. While you start to do that, I'm going to share this out to a couple of different uh, community pages that, uh, and channels that uh, we participate in. Uh, and so, again, welcome to the studio. And if at any time I should ask you a question that you feel uncomfortable with, you can, with love, set a loving boundary uh, with me, and I will respect you for that. And so, uh, with that, uh, again, welcome to the studio. Thank you so much, Jay. Appreciate that. Um, well, um, I had people in my in my world that had had cancer in the past, and I always thought, well, as we all think, that's not going to happen to me. And I can remember it very distinctly when I was, you know, growing up as a child. My mother would, she was a little French woman, about four foot eight, and she would say, you know, put sunscreen on, you're going to get skin cancer, or don't wear an underwire bra, you're going to get breast cancer, and don't do this and don't do that. And I never listened to her because I was like, yeah, I thought I knew it all. So when I first got diagnosed in 2001 with my first phase of cell cancer, unfortunately, it was not a uh, doctor with a great bedside manner. So instead of handling me gently, he just said, oh, we got cancer here. So we're going to get it out right now. It was just supposed to be a consultation. And so I had the nurse come over, jab me with the needle, did some scraping and said, OK, we got it out. And I was shocked. And I thought that was the end of that. Um, so I thought, well, I guess I should have worn sunscreen because back then I thought sunscreen was healthy for you. So um, months would go by and another one, I'd go for another um, uh, checkup and have another one and another basal cell. And then it went to sebaceous carcinoma and then it went to um, squamous. And then it just went on and on and on. And it, it blew my mind away because I had so many of these issues. And every time I'd go into the dermatologist's office, he would get that, that cryo can and spray me and I'd get a spritz here and a spritz there. And sometimes I'd have six or seven spritzes on my body from pre-skin cancers that he found. And it was kind of scary, but I thought, well, as long as, you know, I'm getting checked out and he had me coming every four months for a checkup, uh, which also got costly. But, you know, I did it because I wanted to make sure that everything was going to go well. Um, in 2013, um, I was diagnosed with a uterine uh, tumor that was cancerous. And um, they said that it was inoperable because of where it was positioned. So they wanted to do a total hysterectomy just to see if they could get it out. And I said, no, not interested in doing that. And the doctor was like, oh, well, you know, at your age, who cares? Um, you know, why do you want to have all your, all your female parts? I said, because I do. God gave them to me. I'd like to keep them through life if I can. 
And I said, um, I'm just, you know, I, I truly believe that if it's meant for me to be gone, I'm gone and that's it. So I basically started to prepare for my demise. And I started giving away things, writing letters to friends I had needed to, felt I needed to, to make amends with. And um, I had a, a lot of belongings and a car out in Los Angeles because I would go to Los Angeles because of my business. Um, and uh, I'd stay with a friend out there. So I went out to California knowing that the time was near because she'd given me just a few months. And um, I was staying with him and he said, listen, you know, I, I drink this really great alkalized water. And he goes, I, you know, you need to drink it. And he'd been bugging me for years. And I'd been hearing about this special water for over 25 years from people that drank it. It's called Kangen water in Japan or Kangen water in the United States. So I didn't want to drink his water. I said, no, I'm not interested. So he forced me to drink the water by telling me if I didn't drink his water, I'd have to stay in a hotel for the three weeks that I was going to be out there. And I wasn't happy with that, but I said, okay, whatever, I'll drink your water. So he'd pour it in a bottle. I'd close my bedroom door, pour it down the drain and tell him I drank it. But I wasn't getting any better. I was still sick, very, very sick. And so he, after a couple of days, he said, I know you're not drinking it. So he started standing in front of me while I drank the water. And he would let, let me ask you this, Janine, why were you, why were you uh, opposed to drinking the water? What, what was the block for you? I didn't like water, never drank it. I was a sweet tea drinker, Dr. Pepper, Mountain Dew. Um, never drank water. I remember when I was pregnant with my twins, my doctor would say, you're going to be dehydrated. You're going to be hydrated. dehydrated." I said, well, it is what it is. Cause I just, you know, I, I didn't drink, you know, coffee. I didn't take aspartamine or NutraSweet or any of those sweeteners, but I love my sweet tea, you know, being a North Carolina girl. So I just didn't like water. It had no taste and it was boring. Well, once he started forcing me to drink it, I really liked it. It actually tasted good because it was light and I could drink, you know, a lot of it and not feel it when I was, you know, um, moving around. And so little by little, I was getting better and I was sleeping better and I had more energy and I started losing weight and my skin cleared up. And so he wanted me to buy a machine. And I said, no, thanks. Not interested. Cause I'm going to be dying. Why spend the money on a machine and an ionizer? So I went back to North Carolina and um, he showed up a week later and gave me a device and said, here, I want you to use this. I want you to drink it. Cause I know it's going to help you. And I said, well, you know, and so I told a family member, I said, well, when I'm gone, just make sure he gets the machine back and then I'll go ahead and accept it. Cause you know, I don't want to, keep his gift so I started drinking this so six months goes by and I'm drinking this water and I completely forgot from to go to my follow-up appointment at my OBGYN because I was feeling great I had no more of the symptoms that I had before and I was walking I was losing weight I mean everything was cool so one day um her office called and I answered the phone and she was kind of surprised because they were calling to pay their condolences because they thought I was gone since I missed all my appointments I said no I feel great you know and She's like, well, that's impossible. There's no way you could feel great. You know, you need to come in. We need to see you because it may have metastasized to your brain. I'm like, whatever. So I went in and got checked out and the machine wasn't working. So then they sent my, me and my records to Duke. And then um, the doctor took a look at him and said, uh, well, you must have sent the wrong records because the records are of a woman riddled with cancer. And the woman I just examined doesn't have any cancer in her body. What so year I was, was this? Blown away. 2013. Okay. And so um, I decided, well, I guess I knew it was God, but I thought, well, I guess God used the water as the vessel since that's the only thing I did differently. So I kept on, you know, drinking the water, drinking the water and just say, well, I'll just keep drinking it. So everything was cool with that. And then in the interim, every time I'd go back to get a skin checkup, about three months after me drinking the water regularly, there were no more issues, no more basal cells, no more skin issues. They st he stopped doing using the cryo. So finally, he said, we'll come every six months. And then it got to be one, come once a year. And he knew because he knew how important alkaline water is. And he knew that I drank it. And I sprayed it on my face, which you'll see me doing throughout this because I spray it all the time on my face. Um, he said, you know, you don't have to come but once a year now. So everything was cool. So I thought, great, I'm cancer free. No more problems. No more skin issues. I'm good. Let me, let then, me ask you this, Janine. Um, take a moment here, if I may. Um, besides drinking this special water, um, had you made any other changes in, nope. in your lifestyle? What about nutrition? Nope. I still was a junk food junkie. I still love my burgers and my baked potatoes and my cheese and my dairy and all my stuff. And that's what was so remarkable to me because the reason I enjoyed the way the water worked was because most water, you know, you know, doesn't do anything. And most diets did nothing for me because I was very overweight and so I didn't like diet because I love to eat. So I figured why, why diet? I'll just keep on eating. Cause I figured I don't have diabetes. I don't have cancer. I don't have any other issues. So just let me eat what I want to. So, um, I went in January of 2017, 
for uh, my annual mammogram because every January I do the pap smear. Though I did pap smear the mammogram and skin cancer checks and everything just to make sure I was okay. And they said they found something that looked like cancer. And then they asked me to come back in for a 3D, which I did because I was being obedient. Then they asked me to do another mammogram and they said, yeah, it's cancer. So then they wanted to do a procedure and they said that it was going to be uh, a little invasive. It was going to be, you know, pretty much a lot of uh, scarring because of where it was at. It was going to be a nine to 14 inch incision. And they got me all spazzed out about it. But I said, OK, I guess I have to do it. So I agreed to uh, do the procedure, thinking my doctor knew best. And then I had a very close friend of mine who I'd known for over 23 years who said to me, um, can you come down to, to, to Florida? Um, to visit. And I said, well, I'm going to, you know, I may be coming down to visit sometime soon. And they said, well, you know, I would like for you to meet some people from my church and I'd like to see, just see you before you have the procedure. So I came down and they got together and they prayed on me and they, you know, they put their hands on my breast and they prayed for a couple of hours. And, you know, they were really into this. And, and after they were done praying, they said, we believe you're healed. We believe the cancer is gone. And I was like, okay, well, I didn't want to be impolite. I do believe in miracles and I do believe in healing. But I thought, you know, in a couple of hours, how can that be? But I you know, politely said, thank you. And they said, whatever you do before you get the procedure done, ask them to rescan you again to make sure that, you know, that you do have it before they do it. Because we don't believe it's there anymore. We believe it's gone. And I said, okay, well, I don't know if they're going to do that or not, but I'll try. So I went in for the procedure. The anesthesiologist came in. They all got ready to do their thing because they were going to put me under for it, of course. And I said to the, the nurse, I said, yeah, I got some friends that prayed on me. I don't know if you're Christian or not, but they prayed on me. And I, could you do one more scan before we do the procedure? And she said, oh, we don't do that because we just did you five days ago. And people are in denial and we just would rather just, you know, let's get this done today. And I said, no, I feel really strongly because they were kind enough to do this for me. And I don't want them to, you know, feel like, you know, it didn't work or that their faith was, was challenged or whatever. So she went back to the doctor and luckily the doctor was a Christian, came in and said, I'm a Christian. I believe in miracles. I'm sure your cancer is still there, but we're going to go ahead and do another scan just to make you feel better. And I said, thanks. I really appreciate that. So one technologist or one uh, radiologist comes in and they're messing around, messing around. Then another one comes in. Then the doctor comes in and says, I guess I'm going to have to do this today. And I go, why? She said, because the radiologist said they can't find it, but I'm sure it's there. So she goes and she's scanning and scanning and scanning. She goes, well, um, I'm happy to say and shocked to say that there's nothing there. Nothing. And they had me scanning every which way, raising the arm, front, back, all the way over the place, just, you know, making sure they got to look everywhere. She goes, it's not there. So she looked at the anesthesiologist. She said, we won't be needing you. And I said, what are we doing? She said, you can get up and get dressed and go home. So I was like, wow. <laughs> so, wow. You know, I can't. I can't wow. wait. It blew my mind away. So I was like, wow. Well, hold, hold on. Hold on. Let me let me ask you this, Jenny. Uh, in that moment, can you can you bring me back to that moment? What did it feel like? Because it was more than just a wow. What, what did, did it feel, feel like? like well, as a person who has, has seen miracles my entire life, my entire life. Um to be a part of one like that. I mean, I've had miracles in my life before, like the birth of my twins. They wanted to do C-section. I insisted on natural. So I've seen miracles like that. But this was like the biggest miracle of all. And it was on me. And I felt so special to God. I felt, I've always felt like a child of God, of course. And I've always felt special. But it was like, wow, all the miracles in the world that you perform on other people health-wise, look what you've done for me. It happened in 2013. But it was like, it just blew my mind away. I, I, I was like shocked. I was moved. I was, you know, it, it was like, I was just, I, I felt like I did my, my last day at Hope for Cancer, which we'll get to, but it was, it just blew my mind away. And I thought, wow, you know, this is, this is amazing. That's something that I'm always telling people about being, you know, being hopeful, believing, believing in miracles. Here I was and the look on the faces of everybody in the operating room was so great because they were all shocked. And it blew their mind away. And I love that. Do you recall any physical experience that you had? You, you mentioned the mind. You, you blew your mind away. Do you, <laughs> do you have any recollection of physically what your body felt like when they said, you can get up? You can, you can get up and leave. Well, as I lay down there, I felt like I had a 10,000 pound weight on me. You know, my chest was heavy and I was, my stomach was grumbling, you know, like moving like, I don't know. It was 
the feeling was I was going under the knife and I had not been in a hospital since giving birth to my twins over 30 years ago. So two hospital visits for my twins birth and my third child. And you know, that was it. So hospitals make me nervous anyway, because I, I, I was worried about germs, phobias and, and all that kind of thing. So I felt like thousands of pounds were, were on top of me. And the second that she said that, and she said, you can go home. It was like, the weight was all gone. And that felt just like when I gave birth to my twins, because I had such a difficult delivery. And, and they had told me that myself or one of my twins may die since I was insisting on not doing the C-section. And I remember after the second child came out, all the pain went away, all the anxiety, all the feeling of fear was gone. The second, the second twin came out, it was all gone. And I felt the same way that day. It was like, whoosh, all gone. And it was amazing. Did your relationship with uh, God and or yourself change after that day? No, because my faith in God has always been so strong. Um, I come from um, a Christian family, um, always raised around God. Charles, Stan Pastor Charles Stanley is my ex-brother-in-law. He was married to my sister. Andy Stanley from um, North Point uh, Community Church. He's my nephew. Um, and Graham Lotz was my Sunday school teacher when I was a little girl. Um, I had got rededicated my life to Christ at a Billy Graham conference. So I've always had strong faith. So it didn't make me believe in him anymore. It didn't make him think he was realer. It didn't make him think that he was more present than ever. It just made me believe that for the first time in a long, long time, um, I felt truly worthy of something so magical and special as this miracle because I've always felt loved and special, but I never felt worthy. And that was something I learned at Hope for Cancer Center to feel worthy because unfortunately, and here we're that open, resilient, raw, transparent Janine is, you know, I haven't had a great life. I've had great experiences, but um, had a mother that raised me, a single parent who had the onsets of Alzheimer's in her 30s before I was mm -hmm. born. And then I got a lot of the remnant growing up, um, had an abusive childhood, um, had a father that wanted to sleep with me most of my teen years. And so, and then I got married to an alcoholic. And then, you know, it's just one thing after the other. I lost a child at six months. Um, and it was just a lot of stuff in my life. So I always felt I was loved, but I never felt I was worthy of anything great and magnificent and special other than God's love. So I never expected things. I never thought of myself as worthy of them and just felt as though, you know, God is good to everybody and he's let me live this life this long and he's blessed me with wonderful people in my life and he's allowed me to help people through my water and through, you know, helping seniors, my two passions in life are seniors and veterans. And so, um, you know, when that happened, it was just like, wow, I felt worthy. Um, and there was still some part of me there that didn't feel worthy enough because I felt, wow. I'm special. And, you know, I guess I should have let it max out at that point, but it really maxed out the hope for cancer. Um, when another miracle happened to me. So, um, it was, it was different because as far as my, that was a long answer to your question. I apologize, but That's you know, beautiful. No, no apology <laughs> necessary. You didn't, you didn't say or do anything wrong. Thank you for that. <laughs> I appreciate you. Um, we're going to, I'm going to jump back to the, the worthy piece a little bit later in the conversation. Um, but this is, uh, what I would like to do is invite you to continue along your, your chronological path of, uh, from the time you got up off that table and operating room table and you were told now you're, it's gone. It's, it's dissolved, it, whatever. Uh, what happened next for you? Well, I thought what was going to happen was going to be, um, an excited doctor you know, my OBGYN, when I told her the news, and, you know, that was my first experience personally of realizing conventional doctors, how they, how they view um, holistic treatments and miracles in general. Because when I called her up to tell her, first words out of her mouth, oh, they must have made a mistake. We need to, we need, you need to go back in and have another test. First, first response. And at the time I didn't, I said, no, I'm, I don't, I don't need another one. I'm perfectly fine. Um, everything's good and I'm cool. So I said, well, um, I'll just do things my way. So between her and my regular doctor and other people continually contacting me over the next couple of weeks, telling me, uh, you're crazy. You know, you need to go back. You need to get another opinion because, you know, I don't believe it really got away. Maybe they just missed it. I don't believe that. And these are Christians saying to me, 
I, I don't believe it. it's gone. You need to go back and get to what if they made a mistake? What if the machine was broken? What? And I said, well, enough people looked. Two radiologists and the breast specialist, they all looked and couldn't find it. And I was there. I mean, they were looking for almost an hour. So I said, I really trust, trust what they didn't find anything. Well, um, and I, I feel bad saying this. I, I'm ashamed that they scared me. And they said, you know, you're playing with your life again. You know, you've got children and grandchildren. They're never going to see you again if, the, if it was wrong and it's growing in your body. So they got me paranoid. So I agreed to go see another specialist. And I should have never, ever, ever done that. And I did. I went to her recommendation and went to the doctor. Um, I won't get graphic into how the exam went because it wasn't good at all. Um, and then he decided oh, we had to do another mammogram. So by this point, I'd had um, almost 10 mammograms in five months which I didn't know at oh the time caused cancer, but now I do. I know, I know they cause cancer. Um, so next thing you know, we're doing that. And then he says, we need to do a needle biopsy. So here I am in this room thinking it was just going to be a simple little ultrasound. And after the mammogram and an ultrasound, then he says, we're going to do the needle biopsy. So this needle was like this long. And apparently there wasn't enough Novocaine given to me because when it went in me, it was so painful. I, I, I it, it was more painful than childbirth with twins. Mm. Um, and so mm. it was really, really bad. And finally he kept pushing and pushing. And all of a sudden he just went like that just to get it in there. And I just almost went off the table. I screamed and it was, it was incredible. I, the experience was so bad. And another one, the demeanor was like the first, the first doctor that said, well, you got cancer. You know, we're going to get it out on the, the basal cell thing. So, um, you know, he said, well, we'll send the test results out. And apparently when the needle came out with some flesh, fell on the, on the ground and it was put into a, a little container and sent off whatever. So I didn't think anything of it. I was in so much pain. And then the next day I woke up paralyzed on the right side. Um, I had no feeling in my right, my side. When I contacted his office, he said, um, the, the nurse said, Oh, maybe that's normal. Maybe they hit a, he hit a nerve, but don't worry about it. It'll go away. And it took almost a week to be able to use my right arm again. So that was pretty scary as well. So they called me into the office, um, went in there with my husband and, um, my husband was in the room at the time of that, that needle biopsy, so he almost passed out from what he saw as well. So I'm on the table. He says, well, sorry, uh, this is what I suspected. You got breast cancer. And I went, I do? But he goes, no, but um, put your clothes back on and come into the office and we'll discuss your, um, didn't say options. He said your procedure, which I should have heard the bell go off in my head, procedure versus options, but I was still so stunned. Um, and on top of it, it was a different spot um, than the other one. And it was different. It was like a little star, a little star um, diagram. It wasn't a, again, I've always had dense breast tissue. And now fast forward, I know about these different things and how a lot of the tests are masked as cancer and it's not cancer. And so we go into the office and he takes a piece of paper and he draws a picture of the bre two breasts, draws the little nipples. And he goes, well, this is, this is, what you, this is where your, t your tumor's at. And um, you're stage one, and um, this is the parameters and the areas around it. He goes, and so my, my recommendation, we're going to do a double mastectomy, and then we're gonna, it's going to be followed by chemo and radiation. And I looked at him, and the first words out of my mouth were, I'm not Angeline Jolie. Why do I have to have both if it's just there, and I don't have the BRCA gene? And he says, well, he says, that's, that's what you need to do. Because where it's, where it's positioned, um, it could spread, and this and this and that. And at that point, I was in shock again, but again, I trusted a doctor, which I shouldn't have done. And I said, okay, so I was going to schedule it down the road. And he said, no, we're gonna, we can schedule it for next week. So he was adamant to schedule it for next week. And I said, okay. And I was in shock. He set the date and I walked out of there like a zombie, total zombie. I immediately called my best friend who had done the healing for me and told them, and they were like, you know, just pray about this, you know, pray about this. And, and, you know, something, I, something's not right here with this whole picture. Just let's all pray about it. So they got their church involved and in praying for me and everything. And so um, I, at the time I had a weekly call for my Congan water uh, every Wednesday. And so the surgery was scheduled for Thursday. So my girlfriend said to me, why don't you talk about your cancer on your call? And I said, now my call's about water and hydration and about how great our water is and about asking, answering questions about water. I don't want to tell people about my cancer she said but why not what if one person is on the call and they hear it and see that the call has a playback so people can call you know indefinitely to listen back to the call she said what if one person resonates with you and you might be able to help them well that's all I need to hear if I can help one person I'll do anything so I said all right I'll, I'll mention it briefly so I mentioned it on the call and 
much to my surprise, after the call, I got over the next seven days, but it only took me a few days to see what was going on here. I got over 500 calls, texts, WhatsApp texts, um, on instant messengers, emails, letters telling me, do not do the surgery. Do not take his opinion. Do not let anybody cut up your body. This is your body. There are holistic treatments. There's alternative methods. There's all these different places. There's hope for cancer. There's this, there's that. Go to California because that's where they're all health-minded and check out what's out there. There's rice machines. There's all this stuff. So I was like, wow. So I sat back, thought about it. I prayed and I thought, well, it's 500 to one. So maybe I'll take their advice and I'll cancel the procedure. So I canceled the procedure. I love, I love that ratio right there. I mean, yeah. but you know, what's beautiful about that is that um, you are open. You are open to receive and trust. Yeah. You are, you, because in that moment, you, you acknowledge that you were shocked. You were also in fear. And you also mentioned one more time, you, you trusted a, a doctor, a single yeah. doctor. And um, it's beautiful that through uh, persuasion of people that knew you, that had been touched by you, uh, they, their intuition was telling them something very different. Yeah. And instead of you leaning into fear, you leaned into faith. You leaned into, into trust. Not the doctor, but the 500 to 1 ratio, which is a hell of a ratio to, uh, I take that bet too. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I sure did. And of course, his, his nurses were all upset that I canceled it and giving me this whole spiel again around playing with my life and I'm playing God and my children aren't going to get a chance to see me much longer and all this other stuff. I mean, same old verbiage that they all use. And I said, that's okay. So I did my research, found out about the Rice Machine, found out about these different people. Then I posted on my Facebook because I have 5,000 friends on my um, Enagic uh, Congan Water Facebook page and was asking questions. And so I packed a suitcase just for a couple of weeks, got on a plane and flew to Los Angeles, and I ended up being out there over two years, treating myself holistically. So I did all these different protocols and things, didn't go to clinics and centers, but I did go to City of Hope, um, because I wanted to find out, you know, I wanted to be educated. And when I realized I wasn't going to do the surgery ever, or at least I didn't think I was, but I knew I was never going to do radiation or chemo, even if I was stage four, I thought I want to know everything. So I went to Cancer Center of America. I went to City of Hope. I went to Cedar sinai I went to LA, uh, USC, LAC Medical Center. Um, I went to all these places. I got testing. Mm -hmm. I got ultrasound. I, you know, I talked to doctors. I got my feel of all these different people while I was out there. And they all said the same thing. All of them, except for the initial doctor, said just one mastectomy. They just said, we, we just think the right breast needs to be removed. And then there were a few doctors that said, well, maybe we could try a lumpectomy, followed by chemo and radiation. And I'm like, nope, not doing that. So when I went to City of Hope, they refused to treat me unless I would take their advice. And they said, well, we, we're not going to do a lumpectomy unless we follow with chemo and radiation. I said, why? What if you don't need to? Well, we want to make sure to get around the margins and this and that. I said, that's what testing is for. So they were pushing on that end. And then I go to uh, USC and then the doctor there says, oh, um, we found a spot on the lung. We think it's metastasized to the lung. We want to do a CT scan of the lung. I'm like, uh, no, I don't think so. I'm going to wait on that. Then I went to another hospital and they said, oh, we need to do an MRI to be conclusive, to make sure. And I said, okay, I'll go for an MRI. I mean, it's no big deal. I, I didn't see anything major wrong with that, about that. And then um, they said they had to do contrast. Well, I never had an MRI done before, but I heard contrast makes it come up better. So I said, okay. Well, they never had me sign anything. And unfortunately, and I don't know if you've heard, heard of this dye before, it's called multi hance dye, but you can get GDD, gadolinium poisoning, from that dye. And so the day after the MRI, actually the night of, I was sick as a dog, 104 fever, throwing up, convulsion. I mean, I was like shaking. I didn't know what was going on. So I went to a holistic practitioner in Los Angeles and they did a scan on a, on a piece of equipment that's amazing, Russian technology called an Ascensive Imago. And it showed that I had gadolinium poisoning. And the first thing that the technician said was, have you had an MRI done recently? And I go, yeah. And they said, with contrast? I go, yeah. 
why did you agree to multi hands? I said, they didn't give me a choice. She goes, they didn't have you sign something. And I said, no. So I went back to the hospital, asked them, is there a form I should have signed? She goes, oh, we're, we're, we're sure you signed it because we would have never given it to you because it's quite dangerous. I said, well, let's open up my file and see. So she comes back with this dumbfounded look on her face and she goes, I apologize. We never got you to sign it. That was an oversight on our part. I said, can I see the form? So she shows me the form I should have signed. And it says, can stay up into your system for up to five years, can cause brain damage, can cause hemorrhaging, can cause formation of cancer in the ovaries. I'm thinking like, and they're giving this to people and charging them for it. I was like blown away. So I was like, okay, so no more MRIs either. No more mammograms, no more pap smears, no more mammograms or no more um, MRIs. And so it was such a learning journey. And the only thing I kept thinking every time something happened like this was, okay, guys, one more thing I can learn from my little book that I started, I started to write to tell the people what not to do or what to look out for. So I was doing all this research and I was doing these treatments and I found a, a, a clinic up in Thousand Oaks that I was going to, and they were kind enough to give me a, a special price. And um, I was going there every day for five hours a day, Monday through Friday. And when my credit cards had maxed out $40,000, in treatment at this particular facility, um, I had to stop going because I ran out of money. And so I stopped going and I thought, well, you know, I, I, I bet I got, I bet I got all of it. I'll just do an ultrasound and see what happens. So I had an ultrasound and it had gone down. And at one point I'd gone, you know, uh, it gone over a centimeter and then it gone down again. So I, I thought I was doing good. So I thought, let me just keep doing what I'm doing and everything will be cool. Um, so then a few months later, I go to get another ultrasound and I was now stage two. Uh, I guess because everything I was doing once it stopped completely other than, you know, a little diet and things like that. So I was kind of bummed out about that. And then, um, I, somebody reached out to me, another miracle, um, who can't say who did, but somebody reached out to me and said, you know, you can buy that equipment that you were treating on. And I'm like, how could I ever afford that? And they said, trust me, you can afford it. Uh, and I said, yeah, but I spent so much money to get treated on this. And they said, you can afford it. I did the research. I bought it. And um, so then I was treating on that and everything was going well. And, you know, my diet changed and I was really trying to do everything. Every time I found something, I went to all these health summits. Every time I met somebody, I picked their brain and I, I was doing so many different protocols, soursop tea, all types of vitamins, apricot seed, uh, rebound machine. I mean, I was doing everything. When, no matter who told me something, I'd say, okay, I'll go buy that. I'll do that. I'll drink that. I'll eat that. Thought, what the heck? It can't hurt. And everything you was going well. You mentioned, that you mentioned your diet. You changed your diet. What, how did that change? What did that look like? Well, I changed my diet in Janine's way. I, I did a Janine change of diet, which was no pork and no sugar as, as best as I could not have sugar, meaning 10 packs of sugar in my iced tea and five packs in a cup of tea and eating sugar whole by the spoon. I stopped doing those things. So I thought that would be good because since sugar feeds cancer, my cancer would probably, you know, diminish because of those things I was doing. But I was still eating dairy and still eating macaroni and cheese and two baked potatoes covered in butter. And I was still eating garlic bread, a whole loaf of garlic bread for one dinner. And I was still eating ice cream. So that was my, my way of changing a diet. Let me ask you this. You, now, here you are. You are a woman who, uh, who's intelligent, who's motivated. One would, one would hope who's got courage to step outside and spend two years exploring, researching, learning uh, how to save your own life and, and learning how to say no. Because when you said no to a doctor, you were saying yes to yourself. Yet, nowhere, it appears as though you were um, made aware how much nutrition and it's just not cutting out the sugars. It's just not cutting out the, uh, the, the foods that cause inflammation, the dairy. But there's, there's more to this puzzle piece than just those two things. It's, not, it's more than just cutting out pork. Yet, uh, yet you were not willing at that point. You had not given up control to a large extent of, right. of how you chose to, to nourish yourself. Why do you think that was? And did that change? I know exactly why. I know exactly why. Because I was addicted to food and sugar and didn't know that until I got the hope for cancer. Okay. Uh, and when you see the show, you're going to see it for the whole world to see how my addiction was discovered. <laughs> and I'm not really proud about it, but it, it is what it is. And since then, I've had people come to me 
who saw my story. But um, another thing was because I wasn't educated, to me, bread was just bread. I didn't know it turned into sugar when I was digesting it because I didn't put sugar on it. So that was my stupidity and okay. pasta and all these different things. So that's what well, it's, that's what it's it not about. I don't think it's about <laughs> stupidity as much as it's just a lack of awareness. You know, we don't know what we don't know <clears throat> until we know it. And then it's a choice once we know it, if we go back or if everything changes, that is where the choice comes in. But up until that moment, we're, we're just asleep. We don't know what we don't know. It, I don't think it has anything to do with stupidity. Um, well, thank you for making me feel better about that, but I still feel pretty stupid. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll give you the pass for the moment. Thank you. <laughs> so, so here you are now. You're in the back end of your two years. You bought, you, you've invested more. You, now you've bought equipment, uh, machinery that you believe it was actually helping reduce the, the cancer cells, uh, the tumor size and all that. So what happens next? So I'm co pretty confident and I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. Not feeling great, but I'm feeling good. Um, I found greatness um, at Hope for Cancer. Um, so anyway, so I thought everything was okay. So then I go for another ultrasound um, in June and um, actually the end of May and different place because I always went to different places to have my ultrasounds just in case, you know, they are all mixed together in the same system like they are in North Carolina. And um, the doctor came in and said, I applaud you. I look at your records and I see what's going on. Your two-year journey. I applaud you for what you're doing, but um, your cancer is growing and it's spreading and it's right at your lymph nodes now. So we need to do a lymph node biopsy. And thanks to my two and a half year journey learning, I said, no, I don't think so. And he said, no, we really need to do that. You know, he said, I applaud you for, for your trying to avoid surgery and chemo radiation. I read your notes. He said, but, you know, it's there at the lymph nodes. And he said, you know, that you could be gone within weeks. I said, really? Well, they said it's going to be gone in a couple of months in 2017. And I'm still here. So I said, thank you for your opinion. And I will, I'll handle it myself. So now, I this is May of 19, correct? This is yeah. just, this, this is just, yeah. Six months yeah, ago, end, almost. End of May. End of, oh, end of May, yeah. And so um, then I thought, what am I going to do now? So I have another call that I'm on for the water. And I was talking to some of the people on the call. And one of the ladies said, have you tried going to Mexico? And I said, well, I, I would love to go to Hope for Cancer Center, but I can't afford it. How did you and know about said, Hope for Cancer at that point? I had heard about it years ago from different people that had talked about it. And then when I read Bob Wright's book, Killing Cancer, Not People, one of my favorite books, I know, I know you know this book. Um, it talks about it in there. And then I met Dr. Tony in Atlanta for a Healing Strong uh, Summit last November. And I walked right up to him. He was kind enough to take his whole lunch break to talk to me. And he, you know, we, I told him how much I wanted to come there. And when he asked why I hadn't, I told him because I can't afford it. You know, I just couldn't afford the treatment um, because I'd heard it was very expensive. And I'd heard other people that went there. And instead of researching it, I heard what they paid and said, well, I can never afford it. So, um, it was interesting because apparently he remembered me and I didn't realize he remembered me and you know, their office had, you know, I'd been making calls to their office. And I said, you know, if you ever have any specials you're running, let me know. And so um, I said, Oh, I'd love to do the research, but I said, there's no sense in it. You know, I'm just, I'm just going to like give up and just try to stay healthy as long as I can. Well, some really great friends of mine, um, three people by the name of Matt and Mary and Dee got together and they started a GoFundMe uh, for me. And the money started coming in and I started seeing a ray of hope that I could possibly afford it. So um, with a close friend of mine named Michael in, L in Los Angeles, because I was going to go by myself, I was going to drive into Tijuana and take a look, get in my car and drive there by myself. And everybody was telling me I was out of my mind. They said, the cancer's gone to her brain. She's crazy. And I said, well, I, I, I'm fearless. I don't, you know, I don't worry about that. But he was such a good friend. And he said, no, you, you ain't going to, to Tijuana by yourself. So he rode with me to go. And we ended up checking out because I thought, well, I'll check out to be, so I thought since I was there, why not check out some of the other facilities that people have asked me about? Because in my cancer journey, people have said, well, what about this one? And what about Chipsa? And what about San Aviv? So I thought, well, let me check them out while I'm there. So I checked them all out and I get to the Hope for Cancer one and I'm there. And the receptionist tells me that Dr. Hanines is in town at the um, California office right outside of San Diego. And they would like to meet with you. And by this time, you know, the money was still coming in. And so I was like, really? And so they said, yes. So got, got back in the car, drove back to San Diego to their office and met with him and his wife and had told them about, you know, 
my GoFundMe page and what was going on. And they had researched my records and everything. And he was kind enough to say, we, we did this research, especially with your last ultrasound. And he said, and your tumor is nowhere near your lymph nodes, just to let you know. Thought we'd just share that with you. And I said, yeah, well, I, was, I thought maybe that was the case. But I said, I, I'm glad you found that out as well. So um, found out that it was going to be because different benefactors and the people that had contributed that I'd be able to go. And I was blown away. Well, then they'd set up a date for me to come July the 28th uh, to Cancun. And they said they suggested the Cancun Center because the one in um, uh, Tijuana was more for stage three and four. And at this point, I was still stage one. Um, and they said that that would be probably a better fit for me because I wasn't, you know, so sick that I needed to be in the hospital setting. And then they mentioned the show Eight Days to Me. And they told me that they'd, they'd picked five people um, or they'd picked four thus far. And they were looking for the fifth person and were, were wondering would I be interested. And at the, at the moment they told me, and when I heard it was reality, I was like, no, no, thanks, not me. Because being in the entertainment industry, I know what reality TV is. 90, 98% is fabricated, 2% may be the truth. And I didn't want to be a part of that. And they said, no, this is different. Um, and I said, well, who's doing it? And they said, Charles Maddox. And I went, Charles Maddox, the Charles Maddox, the, the poor chef, Bob Marley's uh, nephew. And they said, yeah. And I said, oh. So I thought, well, that's a little different because I know of his reputation and I know what he has done in the world of health and, and entertainment and, and series and education. So I said, well, I said, this makes me a little, a little happier to hear this. And then they told me that they were going to be there for the whole filming. And they were going to be there to make sure that everything ran smoothly, that the privacy would be given, um, the dignity would be given to all the patients, us five, as well as the other patients there. So they made me feel really comfortable. So I said, listen, I'm in. If they'll help you guys, if they'll help. And all this time, I had not been treated yet. So I was basically doing this, you know, and I said, well, this is great. You know, and they told me about the other patients and Kate and Carrie and Jose and Nicole. And they said, you and Nicole would be the two newbies. The others would be at the mansion, you know, staying at the beach house. Um, and then you would be at the hotel and you would be together. And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm game. Let's do it. And so that was when the journey started. When I, when I arrived and arrived at the airport and a limousine picked me up and they gave me a fresh washcloth to wipe my face. They offered me water, but of course I have my own. And it was just uh, from that moment, it was a beautiful experience. So they take me to the hotel and um, the next morning, um, the Dr. Asa met me at the hotel and introduced himself. Very small world because he knew Charles and Andy Stanley from helping him many, many years ago get started with Dave Ramsey. So it was like kind of a small world. And so we went to the, to the clinic and, you know, got out of the limo and the journey started. And this beautiful lady named Gabby welcomed all of us. She gave us a hug and welcomed us and took us in and, you know, the journey started and it was it was an incredible journey. Every minute, every hour that I was there, and the journey continued after I left. Now, had you gotten a treatment prior to the filming of Eight Days? or, or... No, no, no. They were there the first day, my first treatment. And it was so, funny. So your yeah. treatment was done while they were, you were filming? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Every day. They, gotcha. they filmed every single treatment that was done on me and Nicole as well. And, yeah. um, and it was funny because the first day, um, I had since I'm not used to IVs, I'd never had any IVs. So I didn't know what they were or how they worked. Um, I had some, some massive pain and the pain got worse and it got worse and worse. And my arm started to swell and I had a sweater over me cause it was, you know, it was chilly and I was swelling and I didn't want to say anything to anybody cause they were filming. And so I didn't tell the nurses I was in pain. I didn't tell anybody I was in pain. And then I went to do another procedure in the room and I was lying there with my top off and I started shaking and trembling and my, the pain, I, I can't describe to you on a scale of one to 10, it was like a 20. And I still didn't say anything to anybody. I didn't push the little buzzer because in my mind, I thought, well, this is just me because I'm just a little baby, a little candy, butt anyway, so I didn't want the cameras filming this and for someone to see, oh my God, her first day and she's flipping out in convulsions and I ain't going there, you know? And so I didn't say anything to anybody. So one of the, uh, the, the hospital administrators, one of the clinic administrators, Tara had came, come in the room and she said, are you okay? And I, and I asked him to close the door. So they closed the door and I said, I'm in so much pain. I don't know what's going on. She goes, well, let me get the nurse. So she got the nurse. Nurse came in and just tapped, just tapped the IV machine and boom, the pain stopped immediately. I go, what'd you do? And so the nurse said, well, I lowered the 
you know, she said in, in, in broken English that she'd lowered the flow. And I said, well, what does that got to do with it? Because when I say instant, it wasn't like gradual. The second she touched the machine, there was no more pain there. And then about five, 10 minutes later, all the swelling was gone. Apparently, because when they said it, it was set a little too high. And my tolerance, because it was the very first IV that I had gotten, you know, you learn someone's body, very first IV. And I was so impressed they got the vein the first time because most nurses are like checking around unless you really know their business. So that's what was going on. And Tara said to me, listen, you should have said something. You know, we don't care who's filming. And I said, yeah, but I don't want them filming, you know, a bad experience that had nothing to do with hope for cancer. It was just me being, you know, a little candy butt that's afraid of everything. And I thought maybe it was my fear or whatever. So she, she said to me, from now on, if you have any problem, you use this buzzer and you tell the nurses, let them know what's going on. And I said, okay. So word got around to all the nurses that I refused to share the pain I went through. They were coming to me the rest of the day telling me they were so sorry I was in pain for the morning and they wish I had told them. So I learned from that. I learned the word dolor, which is pain in Spanish. If I had to, dolor, just tell somebody. So from then on, it was, it was okay. Everything was fine. And I learned and we learned about each other, but I just, could not believe what I witnessed at this clinic between yeah. loving care, friendliness, cleanliness, the food, the staff, never saw one nurse roll their eyes at a patient for like, because some patients were in pain or some patients were throwing up, you know, from the other stage three and four patients. And, you know, of course, some nurses, a lot of nurses in America, they roll their eyes. Oh, you can change this bed pan or, oh, I wish you'd go to sleep or wish you'd take a nap. These nurses were amazing. And the doctors were so caring and just unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable experience, Beautiful. and I will never forget. never forget. So, on the back end of that that experience, what what happened with your with your diagnosis that you had been that you got got you there in the first place? Well, um, after finding out on day two that I was addicted to food and sugar due to the amazing therapist, Dr. Leslie, who is uh, the on site uh, therapist. Um, I had to change my diet. I had to do everything differently. And they gave me a specialized diet. Um, they even gave me a specialized diet from the kitchen um, because there were things I literally could not eat at all because of a mutation that they found. And that was another thing that I, and I want to mention this to you because you're so into health. There is a test out there and I really want to mention it on this because it's so important that people get it. It's an MTF HR test. And my chiropractor, Dr. Chet in Los Angeles had told me to get one. And I was like, what for? You know, it was a blood test. He goes, I really think you need to get this because it's important to know all about your body. So I got the test. And when I showed it to my American doctors, they did nothing with it. So I, I just figured it was no big deal. Well, when I first came to Hope for Cancer, they told me before I left to bring all your medical records, all your notes, everything with you in case that I got something that they weren't able to get from the offices when they got them transferred from the offices. And that was another thing. America wasn't really great in responding to get all the records they needed. I guess because they thought this is a crazy person that declined our services, so it will be difficult. So anyway, so they sent me a protocol of everything they were going to do for me before I got there. So I knew the procedures. I knew everything that was going to be done on a daily basis. And so when I got there and gave them all my records, day two, my doctor comes in and he says, may I ask you what possessed you to get this test? And he shows me the MTHFR. I said, oh, that was some test my chiropractor said to get. And he said, this is an amazing test. I go, really? And he says, we don't have this test in, in Mexico yet, but it's a wonderful test. And he said, because of this test and seeing your results, we know now why you got cancer. And we know what type of cancer you have. We know the mutation you have because you have a very rare uh, mutation with, with your chromosomes. If one set's bad, it's not good. If both sets are bad, you're, you're susceptible to having cancer throughout your life in different forms. So he said, so now we're going to change your protocol. We're going to do something totally different and do a whole different thing. I'm like, Okay, he goes, I'm so glad you had this test done and I'm so glad you brought it with you. So since then, I've been telling everybody to get one. And since that has happened, I've had people come to me and say, thank you so much for telling me about this test because I had it and they found out I didn't have this, I had this. They found that I didn't have uh, uh, uterine cancer. I had a cyst that was able to be removed. They found out that I had this kind of cancer because I was allergic to the toxins in my home. So it's a really great test, very inexpensive. Um, and they take like seven bottles of your blood and they do the hair follicle and everything. And it's just amazing. So because what, what, of that area, test, what area is it looking at this test in particular? Well, it, it's a blood test that tests right. everything in your body. Your, what you eat, what you drink, what you, your detergent, uh, the feathers in your pillow. I mean, you can have a reaction and it tells you what your deficiencies are. It okay. tells you what you need, what you're low on, what you're high on, what you're dangerously high on. And I was dangerously high on things. 
and dangerously low on others. And so this was what the problem was. And because I'd had Epstein-Barr and H. pylori and all these different things going on that I found out in California at the treatment center that I was in at Thousand Oaks, you know, all these things, but finally the pieces came together to form the puzzle. So now because of this protocol, so I thought, great, I'm going to leave here cancer free. And the first thing they said to me was, no, 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 no. Uh, very seldom does that happen right away in just three weeks time. You, the, 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 t- the tumor is going to diminish. We know that. We were sure of that because we know our treatments work, but we're going to send you home with protocols. And then months from now, maybe a year from now, um, you know, we believe that, that you, you probably will be cancer free. We, we can't give guarantees, but this is what we believe. So I was kind of bummed out and I thought, oh, wow. Cause I really thought I was going to leave there cancer free. Thought, well, I guess it's not meant to be. And I guess I'm meant to have cancer a little bit longer so I can keep trying to spread the word on holistic treatment. And I thought that was my, that was the plan. So the day before I left, when they ran all the tests, they're looking and looking and looking. And I, I'd done this before that very first time I got diagnosed, they couldn't find anything. And they're showing me the screen in the United States. They love to turn the screen. So you don't see what the test is. You don't see what's there. And then it's like poker face city. You have to figure out what they're thinking while they're looking at it. Well, at hope for cancer. They show you the screen from day one. They let you see everything. They explain it to you. And I was so blown away that the first day they did ultrasounds on everything, lymph nodes, liver, kidney, stomach. I was blown away. And they said, they don't do that in the United States. I said, no one's ever done an ultrasound of anything except one breast. He said, well, we want to do your left breast too. We want to do all of this. And the thoroughness was so amazing because the thermos scan, everything they did, the thermos scan even did the teeth, the cheeks, the head, the ears, everything. And I'd never experienced that back in the States and all the hospitals and all the testing and all the appointments that I'd had, which was over 75 um, in total. I never got any of that done. So when they couldn't find anything and the blood work came back and they said, well, you're NED. And I'm like, I'm cancer free. And he said, yes, senora, you're cancer free. And I was like, oh my God, another miracle. So I felt like I did that first time that they couldn't find anything. And I was just like totally blown away. So it was done in 21 days. And, and it's not that I'm such a great person or I deserve anything special. It's that God is good. It's that there is hope. And it is that Dr. Jimenez and his wife have created a place where people can go for healing, not just as a tumor. Because you see, I went there with much more than a breast tumor. I remember a good friend in my, my water company once said to me, Janine doesn't have breast cancer. Her right breast does. So don't take it so personally like you're damaged and you're poisoned and you're a terrible person because you've got cancer. It's just that one area. Well, I went to Hope for Cancer with addiction, with feelings of not being worthy, a lack of self-confidence, um, hernia that they found, nobody else found, a cyst on my left breast, benign that nobody else found, and a chip cartilage in my elbow that all the American doctors said was in my head. So I went there with a lot of stuff and I left there with everything gone physically, my addictions discovered, worked through and overcome and a totally different outlook on life. Totally. So I feel so blessed because I went there just so that the tumor would be gone, but I got so much more. And when I saw the other patients getting the same type of aha moment, the same type of love and attention, when I saw people that went in there arriving on their first day with no hope. And I saw within days a light of hope. The hope got stronger and stronger and stronger to where they came in smiling and feeling good and happy. And it wasn't a fluke. It wasn't a placebo. It was the care that they were getting there. Spiritually, physically, emotionally, mentally, all aspects. From the staff, from the experience, from the treatments. Dr. Aminez came in and gave a training session on cancer and the causes of it and, and our bodies. And he gave everybody a copy of his wonderful book. And um, it just, it blew my mind away because so much happened there and it was so under promised and over delivered. And it wasn't that way just for me, it was that way for a lot. And I just, I mean, my mission now is to tell everybody I can that there is hope um, and there's hope there because I can give somebody hope by talking to them, but that's the place they need to go. And not just for cancer. I found out on day three that the facility does treat other things as well. It's not just for cancer. So there are people that go there with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, um, there are people that go there just for wellness. They spend a week or two there just for wellness checkups to get the IVs and to be able to get healthier, change their diet. And it's it's really an amazing place. So this is in June. Uh, I, around um, you were at Hope at the eight days. What, what month was that in? That was just this summer. August first. August first. Right, August. Okay. Actually, it was the uh, thirty first of July through the 
um, 8th of August. So how, now that you're, now that you've gone through this incredible experience as you just shared, uh, and you touched on the fact that not only are you NED, uh, no evidence of disease, uh, but it also, you learned a lot more about yourself. You learned more about uh, the emotional side. Um, where does that leave you as far as today and moving forward to, let's say, prevent cancer from returning to your, to your physical being at any time in the future? Well, in addition to changing my diet, 1,000% um, now, um, and in addition to getting more sleep, because my whole, since I was 16, I got probably two, three hours a night. That was it. I'm now seven to nine hours every night. Um, one of the most important things I've done, in addition to the diet, and of course, all the, the protocols and the vitamins and the supplements that they give you when you leave there, because you just don't leave there and you're on your own. You leave there with a path, with a plan, uh, with a program that they designed for you, a diet, supplements um, for up to a year. And so you get all that healing and you get all that information to keep yourself in line and good. I learned about toxicity also in, in life, in family, in friends, um, in the way you're treated. Um, I've always been a yes person. I'll say yes to anybody that needs a favor. I'm always the person that always offers a helping hand. And Dr. and I don't know if you've got the time, but Dr. Leslie gave me this incredible lesson during one of my therapies. She drew on a piece of paper, a dartboard, and she had red circles. And she said, this, this one red dot is you. The big red dot in the middle is you. The outside circle is spouse, best friend, whatever, whoever's in that first circle. The next one is your family and friends. And the next one is Facebook and the world. And she said, every day that you get up, she said, you have to think of the red dot. That red dot is you. You have to be the most important person in your world, in your day. I've never felt that way. I've never been the most important person in my day because I'm so busy trying to help others and trying to save the world and help people get over their addictions and make people feel loved and special that I forgot about me. So I allowed myself, and this has been from, a, from being a little girl, letting people abuse me emotionally, mentally, physically. I was married to an abuser. Um, I, I tolerated all that because I thought, you know, that's all I'm worthy of, whatever. She taught me and the center taught me that I'm worthy of better. So she said, when somebody's pulling at you, and they want you to borrow, they want to borrow money from you. They want you to do a favor. They want to talk to you for an hour. They want you to hear their saga. They want you to run, run an errand for them. You look at that dot and you say, am I okay today? Am I healthy? Am I happy? Am I financially secure? Is my mind clear? Is my day going well? Have I exercised and done my walk? Have I eaten my breakfast? Have I done everything for Janine that I can do? And if the answer is yes, she said, then say yes, be there for others. But if the answer is no, you haven't had your breakfast because I'm the type that would, I would have left and dropped breakfast and the supplements to go help somebody. Or I would stay up all night talking to somebody on the phone and not get my sleep to help somebody. She said, if the answer is no, then you love and you tell that person, you know, I've just gone through cancer and I'm learning to be good to myself. And I'm really, there's things I need to do today for myself that I just, it's not going to give me time to help you with this. I'm really sorry. I can't help you with this today, but you know, I really have to take care of Janine. And that whole lesson that afternoon, I said, oh, I could never do that. She said, well, if you could never do that, then your cancer may come back. And if you, if you choose not to eat the right way and you choose not to put yourself first, then your cancer is going to come back in another spot, in another place. And I'd heard that a lot while I was there. If I didn't do everything I needed to do and stay that way. And I was so shocked at my friends that when they found out I was cancer free, thought I was going to go back to eating my old ways. Like you can have cheesecake. Went to the Cheesecake Factory a week after. They said, go and have these cheesecakes. You're cancer-free now. I'm like, and I'm supposed to eat it now? That's what got me to cancer to start with. And they're like, oh, but you're cancer-free. I said, no, 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 no. I said, I made a pact with God. My being cancer-free, I got the message. So being good physically and being good diet-wise, got to be good self-wise. So for anybody out there listening, if you are in a situation like I've been in all of my life, where you put everybody first except yourself, Beware, you're going to get some type of illness now or in the near future, because that's what happens. And I learned that. And it was a painful experience. And the first few times I told people, no, it killed me inside. I, I literally just, I went into a state of depression thinking, oh my God, what are they, who are they going to get now? And you know something? Every person that I said no to, they survived the next day. Anybody I said, I can't, I can't right now. I can't right now. They survived. And here I was thinking, oh, if I don't do it for them, if I don't 
save them. If I don't save the boat, save the day, loan the money, do them a favor, you know, what's that going to say about me? And so I learned, and what she said to me was, any friend that doesn't understand your journey and is upset because you chose to have breakfast and take your 30 supplements instead of going to the mall with them is not a friend after all. So remember that. So I started looking at my friends and the people closest to me to see. And those that truly loved me and those that truly cared about me and loved me for me and wanted me to stay cancer free said, no problem. I got it. I'll drive myself. I'll call somebody else. You do what you got to do for yourself. Those that didn't love me and those that didn't care copped an attitude. Well, excuse me. I thought you were my friend. Oh, I thought you were there for me. I thought you loved me. I thought you cared about me. I thought you said you'd be in my life forever. Yeah, well, I did. I did make those promises to people because I never thought that my being a best friend to everybody and my loving unconditionally could cause me to get cancer and cause cancer to stay in my body and cause cancer to possibly one day come back. So I learned that lesson and it was a, it was a hard lesson to learn, but I feel good about it because like I said, I'm almost 58 years old and for the first time in my life, I'm being good to Janine and I'm taking care of Janine and I'm putting Janine first and I'm getting my lymphatic massage every week for myself. I would never spend 50 or $60 a week for a massage in my life. I pay for somebody else to have one, but not for me. So now I do that. Beautiful. And it's just, it's been a total change for me. Totally. Beautiful. Well, I will, uh, I would like to thank you for joining me today. Uh, we are over the hour and out of respect to your time and mine, I like to, uh, to, to, to put a pretty bow on a show and, and ask you to perhaps share some closing thoughts. Uh, if there is one woman or man uh, that needs to hear one word or some comments that you have to share, before you do go there, I do want to thank you uh, for stepping into the studio, share, coming forward, sharing your story, uh, being honest, being vulnerable, showing uh, vulnerability with me and sharing your story. I love how you, the last segment of our conversation where you really, really honed in on what, what you today understand was a, a significant cause, root cause behind you uh, getting cancer multiple times with a diagnosis that, um, that basically had you really on a seeking discovery, uh, seeking journey since 2001. And as you uh, are navigating close to the age of 60, you've had your, uh, your awakening, uh, understanding today of truly what's in, most important in your life is not taking care of other people, places, and things, but for the first time in your life, learning how to take care of yourself, how to parent that little, that little girl, that little inner child that's been waiting for somebody to love her unconditionally, for someone to take care of her, for someone to show her, for someone to protect her, for someone to nurture her and someone to nourish her. And Janine, that is you. And uh, so welcome home. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I guess my one word would be what's emblazoned across my chest, which is hope. This is the t-shirt that they gave me when you're cancer free. They give you a, sh a shirt that says, I am hope. And that's basically what I want to be for people. Um, if I could give one word, it would be hope. Because there's if, whether you believe in God or not, because um, there are a lot of people that don't. Um, there is hope. And if you just realize that for people that don't know where to go, to go for hope in life, you go to the Bible. You go to learning what, what Jesus said and, 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 and what's in the Bible to learn how to live your life. To get hope and to get well when you're sick with an illness, hope for cancer is, is, is the place to be. Um, that's, that's the place to be. And you'll learn so much about yourself and you'll leave there. Um, because when I saw everybody else leading with, with the same type of nuggets that I did, it wasn't just like, oh, well, Janine got this, but that's not for everybody. Everybody that I saw there left with something more than what they expected to get taken out. They got felt better physically, but it was the mental aspect. And so for people out there, because I always thought cancer was a terminal illness, don't use that word anymore, and it was a death sentence. And because of Dr. Jimenez, Marcy, the book, the clinic, what I've learned this last two and a half years, I know there is hope. And so that, that's the one, the one word I could just give to anybody. If they think there is none, have them call me. Call me, text me. Um, I'll be glad to speak to you, share my journey with you. Um, don't think you can't afford it because there are, there are plans, there, there are companies out there. 
Um, I just recently found a company that will finance 100% of treatment at Hope for Cancer Center. So, and I'll be glad to share that information with people if they want to get in touch with me. So there's, don't say you can't afford it. Don't say Mexico's too far. Don't say I don't have a passport. They can get your passport in two hours. I learned that as well. So um, for anybody, just pursue it. You're worth it. Don't think you're not worth it because you are, because I didn't think I was worth it. And if it hadn't been for the GoFundMe and the people that love me enough to want to give to me getting healthy, um, I wouldn't be here now or I probably wouldn't be here a year from now. So um, just always look at the box, look at the glass, look outside the box and the glass half full, even if it's got a hole in the bottom of it, because there is hope. And you've given hope to so many people with your show. And I want to thank you because watching you and following you, it's been an inspiration to me because I love how what you're going through right now yourself, you are, you're a lighthouse for other people. And that's amazing. So you should feel really good about that because what you're doing is what I love to do is helping people um, and make the world a better place. And if more people were like you, we'd have a better, we'd have a better place, but it's one day at a time. As I say in the, in the water business, one glass at a time. And um, one hopeful day after the next and just got to keep plugging and, and keep smiling because that's it's all yeah. in the mind. Your mind can help you. you know, your mind can help you get well and it also can bring you to the great. So you have to remember that. Yes. Janine, I, I'd like to thank you um, for sharing your closing thoughts. And here are my closing thoughts for anyone that is catching us live on replay that perhaps is right now in, in, a, in the beginning stages of the reality that perhaps you have a diagnosis, a loved one, a parent, a sibling, a friend, an employee, an employer, um, a child. Uh, what you mean to me, Janine, is hope. What you mean to me is inspiration. Because you see, you were like millions and millions of other people, like I was at one time in, in my own life, where uh, you were just surviving. You know, you didn't even realize that you were living a life just surviving, having not really faced some of your, your wounds from your earlier years, your, perhaps some traumas, some significant moments, experiences that had touched you at, this, at, the, at your core, that had impacted your life and the choices you made and how you got through life was through surviving, was through just reaching for getting through one day, each day, uh, reaching for different means of soothing yourself, which included food, which included, um, uh, as you mentioned, people pleasing, putting everyone else first and you last. And eventually it caught up with you. Eventually your body said, uncle, your body was giving up. Your body was saying, it's time to stop paying attention to me because I need help now. I need you. And ultimately, uh, you had that moment of clarity when you began to truly understand that it wasn't just about the chemo or the radiation or the surgery or even the holistic treatments that may help slow down or may help dissolve the cancer, but it was also the emotional, the mental, and the spiritual components of healing. Dr. Jimenez talks about it, refers to it as the seven principles. We touched on most of them, if not all of them in, this, in our show today. But that's what you bring to this program today, that you, in fact, were just like 98% of the, of the global population, just living life and, and surviving. And what I hear coming from you today is a significant shift. And the shift is coming from surviving to thriving. And I believe that uh, you are well on your way. I wish you the best of success, the best of uh, continued commitment and consistent behavior and choices to yourself. And perhaps maybe it would be appropriate to have you come back in the studio in a year from now. And, uh, and I'd love to touch base and check in and, and see how you have come along and how much more growth you have had for yourself and what new lessons you have learned over these next 12 months. And uh, I would love that. And with that, you know, I, I made it. I just got, uh, I just got a little emotional. 
Uh, but it's good emotions because it's emotions truly about gratitude that there is hope that uh, we all can awaken. I've got a, a close friend of mine that right now is actually in treatment for prostate cancer. He's at a center and he chose to go to a center in the United States um, for treatment. And uh, so my heart and prayers go out to my friend, Joe, and, uh, and know that there is hope because there are people like you that, uh, that show that to us and uh, keep showing up for yourself for us. And, uh, and then continue to inspire those that are open and willing to, to, uh, to have the courage to change and save their own life. Exactly. And one of the things that one of the things that people some people think I'm crazy, other people don't. I really truly believe that this cancer was a blessing. Um, because what I've learned, the people I've met, such as yourself, the people whose lives I've been able to touch through my call, my weekly call and the show and, and interviews and the Facebook page and everything, and uh, you know, it's it's been a blessing to me. And so I would never look at it as a curse. Um, and I'm, I'll always see it as a blessing. So for anybody who's been diagnosed, if you just deep delve deep down inside, because if you're living a, a toxic life and you don't realize it and you don't realize your diet's killing you, if you get cancer and it's a wake up call, knocks you upside the head and you stop doing those things, then it is a blessing, isn't it? Because without the cancer, you wouldn't have known. So I know it's going to be hard for people seeing this to say, yeah, I got cancer. That's a blessing. If you really think about what it's telling you, it's, it's a wake up call to say, Hey, either you're doing one thing wrong, two things wrong. I was doing 20 things wrong. And it caught up with me repeatedly, repeatedly from 2001. So, uh, I totally get that. And I just, I just thank you so much for, for all you do because your, your program is healing the mind, the body and the soul. And that's what, that's what matters. Hmm. Janine, thank you so much for being here. Uh, enjoy so the, much, the rest of your afternoon. If you could stay in the studio just for one moment. Uh, for those sure. of you that joined us on live or on replay, thank you for, for uh, supporting Janine and myself today. Without you, we wouldn't have a reason to be here. So thank you for catching us live or on replay. And uh, no matter what you got going on in your life today, start each day by doing some form of self-care. Uh, take time for you. Take time to go into that center of that, of that circle. As Janine mentioned, that, that big red in the center, that bullseye, that's you. Take care of yourself today and uh, your life will, will in fact improve. Thanks for joining us on Real People, Real Health. We'll catch you next time.